One of the phrases I use, and I have this in the book, is that habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. So it's like the same way that as far as compound interest you know, accrues through finance, your, the effects of your habits multiply over time. And so often these choices that you make, they're these little 1% improvements for you or against you each day, and they're very easy to overlook. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. What really is the difference between eating a burger and fries or a salad and chicken for lunch? Mm. You don't really it see a whole lot. lot better. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> it tastes that's amazing actually, in the moment. That's actually a crucial point uh, that I cover in the book, which is that habits that are immediately satisfying are more likely to be repeated. And so pretty much any behavior produces multiple outcomes across time, right? Like if you eat a donut right now, it's tasty mm, and sugary. So good. But in the long run, you gain weight. And so the... The immediate outcome is favorable. The long-term outcome is unfavorable. With good habits, it's often the reverse, right? Like you go to the gym right now, and it takes effort. You sweat. You have to work hard. You have so to sacrifice outcome, your time for Netflix and chill to go train. The immediate outcome is unfavorable, but the ultimate outcome, you're in shape in a, you know, a year or a month or whatever, right. is favorable. And so the challenge for building good habits and breaking bad ones is often finding a way to pull the long-term consequences of your bad habits into the immediate moment so you feel a little bit of the pain right now and want to avoid it, and the long-term rewards of your good habits into the immediate moment so that you have a reason to repeat it again in the future. So is it kind of like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym and eat donuts at the gym. <laughs> so I feel good, but also realize this is going to help me long term. So in the book, I talk about this concept I call identity-based habits. And essentially, what you're, the ultimate form of immediate gratification is the reinforcement of your desired identity. So you go to the gym and you're reinforcing the identity of, I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Or you show up to write and you're reinforcing the identity of, I'm someone who writes every day. And so you get a little bit of immediate satisfaction from being that person and being aligned with your identity, your values, your principles. Um, but you also get the long-term rewards from showing up every day. And mm -hmm. so what you don't want is some kind of immediate reinforcement, like eating a donut at the gym, where you're casting votes for two different identities. Right? It's like, I showed up at the gym, I'm casting a, a vote for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, the type of person who's healthy, but then I eat a donut, so now I'm casting a vote for being an unhealthy person. So being it kind of like washes either. out, yeah. right? So you want, you want reinforcements that align with your principles and values. So you right? essentially have to form your identity first. Is that what I'm hearing? So who you want to be. I think that your habits are the way that you embody an identity, right? So like each time you uh, make your bed, you embody the identity of someone who is clean and organized. Each time you go to the gym, you embody the identity of someone who is fit. Each time you sit down to write, you embody the identity of a writer. So you can sort of think of it as like each behavior casts a vote for the type of person that you want to become. And if you cast enough votes for that type of identity, you start to believe that about yourself, right? Like if you, you go to church for 20 years, you believe that you're religious. You study Spanish every Tuesday for 30 minutes, you believe mm -hmm. that you are studious. Um, so in that way, your habits provide evidence of your desired identity. And I think that that is probably the ultimate reason that habits are so important. It's true, like habits can help you earn more money or be more productive or lose weight. Um, and all that stuff is great. But in addition to the external results that habits provide, they also shape your sense of self. They like are the, the engine or the avenue through which you learn to believe things about yourself. Like sometimes people will say stuff like, fake it till you make it. But fake it till you make it is asking yourself to believe something without evidence for it. And you can do that for a little while. You could do it for a day or a week. But eventually, I mean, there's a word for beliefs that don't have evidence behind them, delusion, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're deluding yourself, then eventually you give up on that. But the power of doing a better habit each day or casting a little vote for that type of person is that now you have evidence to root your belief in. Yeah, and so now I've done it for six up, months, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, now you have a lot of evidence that you're a podcaster or a right. good interviewer. You know, like you do this over and over again each time you cast a vote for believing that about yourself. And you don't just, you aren't delusionally believing that you're a good interviewer. It's because you've shown up and done it hundreds of times. Right. Um, and so I think that that's true for any habit, large or small that they provide evidence of the desired identity or the, the type of person that you are. Mm. What are the five non-negotiable habits for you on a daily basis? Oh, that's a good question. So 
Obviously, this is going to depend on your goals. For me specifically, uh, I think there are a few core habits that are going to serve everybody and certainly serve me well. So exercise is a huge one. Um, I don't do it daily, but I exercise, I train four times a week. Yeah. And I feel like if I didn't exercise, I don't know that I would be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't know if I could handle the psychological roller coaster without the physical outlet. Yeah, the release, the... You probably feel that as yeah. like an athlete too, you know, like Not I, too. for uh, being an athlete for so many years, I feel like I need to push myself physically in addition to mentally. Absolutely. If it's just mental, <clears throat> it doesn't do it for me. I, I no. need to have a physical outlet. So exercise. Exercise is one. The other, the ultimate meta habit is reading. Because if you build a habit of reading, you can solve pretty much any other problem. You know, you want to hmm. learn how to be a better podcaster, you can read about that. You want right. to learn how to meditate, you can read about that. You want to learn how to make more money, you can read about that. Um, and so what you need is to develop a habit of reading and then whatever problem you're facing at the time, you can, you have a method for solving that. Okay. Um, writing for me is huge. I don't actually know what I think about something until I write about it. Huh. I find that if you get your I, ideas that you get it out, if you ask me something right now that I haven't written about before, what is really happening is I'm just talking my emotions. So what I mean is that you'll ask me something and I'll get an implicit feeling about what, what that topic is. I'll have some intuition, a gut feeling about it, and I'll say whatever that feeling is driving me to say. But I don't actually know if that's what I really think, what I deeply think, until I have the time to sit down, the write it out, and the logically go through it. Because a lot of the time, you know, if you would ask me the same question next week, I might have a different feeling at that time. So then I'm talking different emotions. So I think I actually need to, to have time to sit with it a little bit and write, write it through to learn mm, what I actually okay. think. So writing's third. Ex exercise, reading, writing. Um, I don't know. I would say that those are probably my main three. Yeah. Uh, if I was going to pick five and the other two that I would add, going for a daily walk would be a huge one. That's one that like I kind of aspire to because I don't do that every day. Um, but any that... time I do, it really benefits me. In what ways? Well, you see this with a lot of anybody who does creative work in particular, um, that something about getting outside and walking, I think there's, this is just me spitballing, I don't actually have science behind <laughs> this idea, but um, when your body is moving, it's very hard for you, one, to not be active mentally. Like if you, think about someone who's shut down mentally, what does their body language look like? They're usually closed Dead. off, their yeah. arms, like they're sitting, they're not moving very much. Try to be closed off mentally and be dancing physically. It's very hard to do. If your body is moving right. like that, it's really hard for your mind to be shut down. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. It kind of gets like the juices flowing. The second thing, and this is where I'm spitballing. I don't know if this is actually true, but I wonder about your non-conscious mind being like a bottleneck sometimes. And so if you're, if you're moving, if you're walking, it gives your non-conscious mind something to do. So you're like, it gets out of the way. And now you can actually like have this stuff arise or think um, in a different way than if you're sitting. Um, so I don't know. I think that those are two yeah, benefits. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so that'd be the fourth thing. Sleep is the fifth one. Um, and this is one that I actually am pretty good about. Uh, so my cardinal rule is that I don't cheat myself on sleep. Um, so if I stay up late and work till midnight, uh, I'm going to sleep till eight or nine. Sleep it in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not going to get up early because I don't want to cheat myself on that. But um, yeah, I think that those are, are kind of the core things. It's funny, sometimes people ask like, oh, how can I double my productivity or something like that? And you'll see articles like that all the time, like follow this one five minute trick to double your productivity. But the real answer to most of that stuff is like, get eight hours of sleep a night, <laughs> exercise, don't eat like crap, and then instantly you have this boost of productivity yeah, and motivation. Exactly. I mean, you have energy. The fundamentals are covered 90% of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you said this, you said you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. Mm. Uh, what are the systems you created to be successful beyond those kind of core habits right there? Yeah, so this is a really good question. I think first I just want to talk a little bit about that, that point that you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. What do I mean by that? So often when we set about to change something or to achieve something, the first step is almost always setting a goal. Uh, and this is coming from someone like I was very goal oriented for a long time, right? Like You're I an set, yeah, I would set yeah. goals for the things I wanted to do in sports, the goals for the grades I wanted in class, <clears throat> the goals for how much money I wanted to make in my business. And sometimes I would achieve those, but then sometimes I wouldn't. And so I had this question like, well, clearly I'm setting goals for both. So like that can't be the thing that determines it. And you see this a lot that the the winners and losers in a particular domain often have the same goals. Like every Olympian wants to win a gold medal. Sure. Uh, every job candidate wants to get the job. 
So if the winners and the losers have the same, the same goal, then the goal cannot be the thing that distinguishes the two. And the thing that distinguishes them is the process, the system behind the goal. And this is also important because achieving a goal often only changes your life for the moment. So like, you know, say you're, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just take like a simple example. Say you have a messy room, you know, and you, set, you get motivated and you set the goal to clean your room. Well, you can do that in an hour and then you have a clean room, but if you don't change the sloppy habits that led to a messy room in the first place, then you just end up with a dirty room again. Yeah. So it's like treating a symptom without treating the cause. And um, habits are, are a better solution in that case because if you fix the inputs, the outputs fix themselves automatically, right? You don't have to fight uh, to have a clean room if you have clean habits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's true in a larger sense as well, right? Yeah. People want outcomes, they want to earn more money or lose weight or be more productive or reduce stress. But the outcome is not the thing that needs to change. It's the system that precedes it. Mm. So give me the, let's, let's bust the myth of how many days it takes to set a habit. <laughs> because there's 14 days, 28 days, 60 days, yeah. a year. Right. If you do something every single day, and maybe it changes for each person, but what's the science or the, uh, the statistics say about how long it takes to form a positive or negative habit, I guess? So 21 days is the thing you hear all the time, 30 days, 100 days, whatever. Right now, 66 days is making the rounds. Is the latest I saw time. that in another book. What was that book? Well, there was one study done that found that 66 days was the average uh, for how long it takes. And as a rule of thumb, I don't think it's terrible. Like you should remind mm -hmm. yourself, yeah, this is going to be months of work. It's not just going to yeah. be something quick. But even within that study, the range was quite wide. So if you did something simple, like drink a glass of water at lunch each day, it would take like three weeks. If you yeah. did something more difficult, like go for a run after work every day, that would be like seven or eight months. But I think actually that question to begin with is sort of a, there's like a broken mentality the behind it. The wrong question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because if you ask that question, the implicit assumption is, when do I have to stop working? Or when, when is this done? Um, and, and is it automatic after a certain period of time? Well, the honest answer to how long it takes to build a new habit is forever. Because if you stop, then it's no longer a habit. It's a constant choice and a decision, right? I think... People often look at habits as like a finish line to be crossed, but it's actually a lifestyle to be lived. Mm. And if you look at it as a lifestyle change, then you're saying, you know, okay, okay, what's something small and sustainable I can stick to, right? What's something that can actually last over time? Um, so it is true that, uh, and you can actually map this through research, that a habit will become more automatic with practice. But this reveals another important point, which is that there's nothing about the amount of time elapsed that leads to habits being built. You could practice something once in 30 days or you could practice it a thousand times. What actually leads to a habit becoming automatic and becoming learned and ingrained is repetition. So the phrase that I like to use is not 21 days or 30 days, but put in your reps. I mean, that, that's the real thing is you need to, you need to practice. And mm -hmm. if you put in your reps, then your brain starts to automate how that process works. Yeah. What makes you an expert on habits? Oh man. Based not. on lots of other people that are talking about habits. Why are you talking about it differently and what have you discovered that's different than everyone else? Okay, so two questions there. So the first one is expertise. Um, and I think that, and I've said this many times before, I'm just going through this with everybody else. Uh, I consider my readers my peers uh, in the sense that we're all just trying things out. The only difference is I write about what I learn and share it each week, mm -hmm. and, but we're all just learning along the way. Um, Early on, I had a feeling like that. I was like, who am I to, you know, I'm just a guy. Who am I yeah. to write about this? And I had a friend tell me, the way you develop expertise is by writing about it every week. So I wrote a, a new article about habits every Monday and Thursday for three years. And that was how I developed the expertise on the topic, was by yeah. writing about it. You did research. Right. And you said, here's what I found. Here's what I tried. Here's what worked, what didn't work. It's a combination of me reading the scientific literature and reading the research and then trying to distill the practical insights from that and testing things out in my own life as a weightlifter, a travel photographer, a writer, an entrepreneur, and seeing what that looks like and then the two together. And I think you need both. Like I don't wanna be some new age version of an academic who's in an ivory tower just like theorizing about ideas. Is different what it looks like to put ideas into practice, mm -hmm. right? Like imagine you're a peak performance coach and you show up to coach like an NBA team. And these guys are like, dude, you need to step on the court if you know what, right, to see what it's actually like. Um, so you need to have both to, okay. to have a firm understanding of that. So you were researching and you were applying it into your life. And what was the second part the of that? The second balance? question, yep. which I think is probably the more interesting one, which is what makes my angle different? Mm -hmm. or what makes this different? Than every other book out there about habits. So 
you can broadly put books about habits into two categories. The first book, uh, the first category is what I'll call motivation models. So motivation models are about what sparks a behavior. How do you get started? How do you get motivated? The second category is what I'll call reinforcement models. So how does a habit stick? How does it last? Why do certain behaviors get reinforced? And sometimes books will touch on one, but focus primarily on the other. A lot of the time they'll just kind of live in separate worlds. That's what I would say is it happening in like the self-improvement space. Then you have the academic space, so psychology or neuroscience or whatever. And a lot of those books are focused on the why, but not the how. They'll tell you, um, they'll tell you why something happens, why a particular neuron fires, why a particular biological process uh, works the way it does, but they don't tell you how to implement it in your daily life. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was try to combine the two. Why um, and how. Yes, a, why, <clears throat> a book that is both why and how. Um, why do habits form the way they do? Why are they important? And then how do they actually work? And uh, my hope is that Atomic Habits was able to do that largely because of the framework that I put together. So in the book, I lay out these four stages that all habits go through. And I felt like we needed a new model because most of the models right now are either a motivation model or a reinforcement mm -hmm. model, but not both. Okay. And you need to understand what both sparks a habit and what makes a habit Maintains stick. Maintains it, yeah. yes. If you wanna be able to understand how they work and right. how to make them last. And what are those four frameworks? So the first stage of every habit is a cue. The second stage is a craving or some kind of prediction that your brain makes. I'll give you an example of these in a second. The third stage is the response, and then the fourth stage is the reward. So mm -hmm. you walk into a, um, the question I had that, that no model I could find could solve in, in any good way or explain in any good way was, why can the same person respond to the same cue in a different way? So let's say you get into the habit of going to the gym at five o'clock every day. But then sometimes work gets busy and you don't go to the gym at five o'clock. Current models don't explain that very well because it's like, well, the queue is five, you should be going to the gym right now. It says you, the routine falls automatically after the queue. Um, or why, uh, why does someone walk into the kitchen and see a plate of cookies and then they automatically wanna eat it, but you could just as, imagine, uh, just as easily imagine that you just got done eating dinner in the other room and you're stuffed and you're full and you walk in and you see a plate of cookies and you're like, I'm stuffed, I don't wanna eat anything. So what's going on there? Mm. And I think these four stages explain it, which is you see the cue or you experience a cue and then your craving or your prediction differs based on your current state. So the way that you interpret the cues in your life is contingent upon the current state that you're in. The way you're feeling. Right. Um, and also other things like your beliefs mm. or your identity, the social group that you're part of, right? So like if you're in a different group, then maybe you interpret things in a different way. Um, you know, you could imagine one group, they practice a particular religion, they walk into a butcher shop and see pork and they don't, they're like, oh, we can't eat that. Right. Another person walks in and they're like, oh yeah, I'll have a pork sandwich because it's obvious and easy and right there. Um, so what you choose is contingent upon how you interpret the cues in your life. If you wanna learn more about how to master your mind, check out this next video right here. We're all faced with great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations and we are at that point at that nexus point in our, our evolution as a species. So then you don't try to fix that. That's never gonna work. What you do 